Dear friends and family in Christ, may God's grace, mercy, and peace be with you now and always. Amen. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you for each day that you give to us. Each opportunity you give us to trust in you, to be inspired by you, to share our faith with others. We pray, O Lord, that you would guide us now and always, that we would love others as you love us, that we would reflect your love to our world, to our community, to all those in our lives. Lord, help us to trust in you. Know that your plan for us is that we would spend eternity with you. This we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Recently, I was on Facebook, and I was looking at various posts, and one of the posts I came across was a friend of mine, Richard, who's down in southern Louisiana. He's also a fellow pastor. And he and his wife, Bridget, they were out garage sailing, going to various places to look for things that they could uh, add to their home. And they came across a 5,000-piece puzzle. Well, they, well, they t bought the puzzle, and they took it home. Now, the post that Richard posted uh, was after they'd spent a week working on this puzzle. In all of their spare time, instead of watching TV, they were going on the Internet, they were on the, working on this puzzle. 5,000 pieces. Well, his post was this beautiful picture of a barn in the countryside. And then you clicked on it, and you noticed three pieces were missing. Three pieces! His first mistake was buying an open box puzzle, but three pieces. Can you imagine how frustrating that must have been? 50 pieces or 20 pieces or something like that. At least you would have seen it coming, but three pieces. We can imagine his frustration and Bridget's as well. Because it's not just puzzles that we do that with, but it's life. We don't like there to be missing pieces, do we? We like everything to fall right into place, to have the full picture, the image, the barn in the countryside. And that's not how life works, is it? Sometimes you're told by the, the gas company that it's going to be that, that the gas guy will be there sometime between eight o'clock in the morning and eight o'clock in the evening. And don't plan anything because if you happen to go out during one of those during a minute during that time, well, that's when he'll show up. Frustrating, isn't it? Or some of you have had to go to the doctor. You've had various tests, various examinations. After going through the, these tests and examinations, still no answers. Not all the pieces come together and the doctor still shrugs his shoulders or she shrugs her shoulders. Frustrating, isn't it? We don't like puzzles that don't form a picture. We don't like puzzles that we can't see the beautiful outcome. And then we come to our epistle for today. It seems like it's a bunch of pieces of Romans chapter 11 just sprinkled together here and there and everywhere, woven together to kind of read okay, but still missing parts. Well, if you happen to Google Romans 11, you'll find that the lectionary isn't so far off the rest of the world. Because if you Google Romans 11, you'll find all over the place, different places and different, with different texts. You'll find a piece here and there. Some of them Daniel's prophecies about the end times. Some of them with Ezekiel's prophecies. Well, some will even be with John's images of Revelation. Sprinkle the verse here. Sprinkle the verse there from Romans 11. Irritating, though. Irritating because all you get is this one small verse. This is what we call proof texting, by the way. Not that we'd ever do that here, but it's taking one verse out of Scripture, taking that one verse and basing an entire faith doctrine on it. You can imagine how that's not a good idea. But you see this all over the place. People who stake their entire faith, their entire thinking of the Bible, that Israel must be restored as a physical nation on a few brief verses out of context. And this is usually how Romans 11 is. Treat it as though it's a, just pieces to be picked at here and there. But is that really what Paul had in mind? Do you think that as Paul wrote this letter to that church in Rome, that he had in mind for them to read a piece here and a piece there and never to see the beautiful big picture? I don't think so. I think that as Paul wrote this book, wrote this specific chapter, Romans 11, he wanted the people of God to see a beautiful image of what it means to be God's people. He wanted them to see a picture and be inspired by that picture of who they were meant to be. And if you remember right, 
He wanted to remind them that it's not going to be Jews or Gentiles, but Jews and Gentiles. That salvation is intended for all. And so as we look at Romans chapter 11, we're going to look at the entire picture. Instead of taking a picture, a, a verse here, a verse there. That's why I encourage you to read through the entire chapter later so that you can see this entire picture unfold. But sometimes we have a tendency to zoom in on one particular verse. Here, or there, or everywhere. We have a tendency to get lost in the details. And we have an idiom for this. Losing the forest for the trees. Most of you know that. It's the idea that we miss the bigger, beautiful picture because we're so focused on the details. Now that's not to say that the details aren't important. Because they are important. That's where the devil changes the thing, changes the verses, those little details. But we also need to make sure that as we look at those beautiful details, we see how they come together to show us who we are as the people of God. Now, sometimes reading Romans 11, though, if we do this, we find ourselves on, in two places that are, we don't want to be. On the first side, we find ourselves, if we just take verses here and there, we see Paul almost sounding anti-Semitic, or at least laying grounds for the church to be anti-Semitic. God, after all, has rejected the Israelites. He's rejected the Jews. So therefore, as a church following God, shouldn't we do the same? Some theologians feel this way. They'll go to Roman, Romans 11 and they'll look at this and say, well, see, that was the branches that were cut off that were going to be thrown in the fire. John chapter 15, if you go back there, you'll see Jesus said if the vine is hacked off, it will be thrown in the fire. But back to Romans 11, there's theologians who will look at this text and they'll suggest that there's no hope. Once God allowed Rome to take over Jerusalem in 70 A.D., scattering the Jews everywhere and every place that he had forgotten about them. Now, that's one place we don't want to go, but oftentimes go, theologians will go there. What happens when you look at just the details instead of seeing the full picture? On the other side, you have theologians who will read about Paul's words of hope because there are words for hope, words of hope in Romans 11. But as you read it, they take those verses and they believe that Paul believes there's going to be a new Israel, a new physical Israel, a new nation, that there's going to be a new temple. And they call themselves restorationists. We, some of you know these theologians. They talk about in their political movements and arguments all come back to how will Israel be restored so that Christ will come again. And again, they lose the big, beautiful picture. Again, they take little pieces of Paul, little parts of Paul. But that's not what Paul's point was. If we go back to the verses we read today, if we look at the verses in Romans 11, we see that Paul wanted us to be assured of God's promises. He wanted us to be inspired by God's promises to know that He has a way of salvation for us. To know that those branches that have been broken off, that we have been grafted into those branches, made the people of God, not by our own doing, but by His work and salvation on the cross. He wants us to return to Romans 11 to see hope. Hope for a disobedient people. Hope for a disobedient Gentiles and hope for disobedient Jews. Even Paul, as he uses himself as an example, he wants us to see that God didn't completely reject the Jewish nation, just as He never completely rejected anyone. He intended to bring salvation through His Son, through the Messiah. And Paul uses himself as a living example. He says, look at me. If God had rejected all Jews, all, of, all those of Jewish descent, there'd be no hope for Him even. But on the other side, he also uses himself as an example. And he points out the disobedience. He points out the fact that the nation of Israel, the Jewish people, had stopped following God. They had been disobedient. They had not sought the Messiah. They had not sought the salvation that God sent. And so what Paul, as he writes Romans 11, wants to do is remind us that all of us have been disobedient, both Jew and Gentile. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us have failed to keep God's command. But all of us are saved by Christ's righteousness. 
this is the big picture Paul wants us to see. But if we get locked into the details, we'll never see this beautiful picture. If we get locked into the details, it can lead to fear and even distrust. Questions of God. Because if you think about it, if we go back to Romans 11 and we read those words, we might ask ourselves, well, God, He stopped. The people of Israel were no longer His chosen people. Could that happen to His church as well? What if we're unfaithful? What if we stop living as the people of God? What if we stop showing our faith? Can we trust God to continue to have us as his chosen people? And that's why we don't look at just the details. That's why we don't focus in on those three missing pieces. Can we look at that beautiful picture and realize it's not about us, but it's about what God is doing for us and through us. It's about what God has done as his people, as we are his people. It's about the way that God uses his word, made flesh, Christ Jesus, to bring salvation on the cross for us. You know, you look at the Old Testament, and you look back there, and you see this promise of ages. You see this promised Messiah. And many times we wonder, how could anybody miss that? How could they not see that Christ is the anointed one? That Jesus is the Messiah. But then we think about our own lives. We think about our own, the way that we live our lives. And do you always live a life that reflects Jesus as your Lord? Because we live in a culture today that says it's okay for you to worship God. It's okay for you to pray. It's okay for you to be a follower of Christ Jesus. Just don't share your faith with me. Because if you share your faith with someone else, you're considered intolerant. You're considered disrespectful. If you tell others that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one gets to the Father but by Him, that can be considered hate speech. Instead of you sharing the peace of Christ, you're accused of sharing His intolerance. And that is the culture we live in, folks. A culture that says we are free, we have freedom of religion, so long as you don't impose your belief on someone else. There's a group right now called Freedom From Religion. They've chosen this name because they don't want to see Christianity or any other religion supposedly imposed, whether it be stopping a diner in Georgia from giving 15% off for, uh, for those patrons who pray out loud which there was a diner in Georgia that was doing that. Or trying to push the various armed forces, branches of the armed forces, to stop allowing Scripture to be used. Thanks be to God, they st- we still see Scripture used on military bases throughout our country and around the world. But this freedom from religion group doesn't want to see your faith. It's fine if you want to practice it on your own, but they don't want to see it. And that's sad. Because in this, they say that peace will come. Because everyone will have their own religion, and that's not the case. Because we know the words of God, that true peace only comes in knowing Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. That true peace only comes when we know that our sins are forgiven. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But then he follows that up right after that, Paul, in, in Romans 3 but are justified freely by God's grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That free gift of God. That free gift of God is what brings peace. That free gift of God is what brings life to death. That free gift of God is that which we have been called to proclaim, which we have been called to share. That word of God. Because for God... He does not want a single person to not hear this promise, to not receive this gift of forgiveness. See, God, he might have a 5,000-piece puzzle, but even if he had every piece except for a single one, it would not be complete for him. It would not be beautiful. And so God, our Heavenly Father, he loves us so much. He loves the disobedient, the sinners so much that he continues to pursue us. In fact, Jesus gives us A parable in Luke chapter 15 which reminds us of this promise. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, 
if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. What a beautiful parable. A beautiful reminder that every single one of us, every single person who is lost and dying, is worthy to God. That He desires every single one of them to be saved. Just as He re- desires each of us. Paul's vision was not only to share the Gospel message, not only to show those people in Rome, those Gentiles, that they were saved, but he had a hope. He had a hope that not only would the Gentiles be saved, but those Jewish people that he was from, his brothers and sisters of the flesh, that they too would hear the Gospel message, they too would receive the Messiah, and they too would be saved. That they too would be brothers and sisters in the Spirit, just as we are. And that is God's desire for all people. And He will not rest until every last sheep is found, until the entire puzzle is finished. He will not rest. He will continue to pursue. And He continues to send us. He continues to send us, His people, to chase after those lost pieces, to chase after those lost sheep, to share that good news. And so I wonder, What conversations is God leading you to have? I wonder, what conversations is God leading you to stop avoiding? Maybe there's a father, a mother, son or a daughter who you know that's maybe at one time they were in the church. Maybe they were never in the church. and Maybe the Lord has been putting it on your heart. The Holy Spirit has been moving for you to speak to them, to share with them to talk to them about your faith. That's a long conversation. It's not a day or two. It could be weeks, months, even years. Maybe there's a shorter conversation that God's been leading you to have with the person that you see walking out of Vons or walking into Carol's or Denny's or, or Carl's Jr. or wherever you like to eat. Or maybe the person who, fill, who stands there as the attendant at the gas pump God puts us in all sorts of places, all sorts of times, not by accident, but to share our faith, to have those conversations, to proclaim to others the good news that God has promised salvation for all who believe in Him, that God has made a way of salvation so that we might live with Him forever, that God desires all to be saved, and the world will not be picture perfect until every last piece is in place. May you be inspired by the hope and promise that God desires all of us to be with Him in eternity. In Jesus' name, Amen. Please pray with me. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank You that You have entered into our world, that You have pursued us, that You continue to pursue us as your chil- to be Your children. Forgive us for those times when we lose sight of that promise. Forgive us for those times when we lose sight of your salvation that has been won for all people. Lord, lead us to seek your will, to seek your guidance. Lead us to live out our faith and to share our faith. Lead us, O Lord, to have those conversations, to stand firm in our faith, so that all may know you as Lord and Savior. Lord, we thank you that even if it was just us, that you would go after even one of us because of your great love. Lord, may we hold that in our hearts, trusting in you, being inspired to share with others the good news, the promise that one day we'll live with you in eternity. This we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, who is our Lord, who is our Savior. Amen.